Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye alahudi samyao sanputoshe. Namo sadanto suchedoye alahudi samyao Dream wondrous dark, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dhamma friends, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let's see now, that would be good evening to the people in California. We're here for our Flower Garland Sutra Lecture. Those of us here in Australia, it is Sunday, May 30th, it's Saturday, May 29th, uh, up over, we are down under here, and we're going to be looking into the 10th, the tenth of 10 stages of the Flower Garland, the Avatamsaka Sutra, and personally, I'm really looking forward to today's lecture because there's a lot of uh, stories to share. This is a special, special section of the text. And let me uh, say what we're doing to give you some orientation. We're in, uh, <clears throat> out of 10 stages, we're in the 10th. We're just about to finish this chapter. And every one of the stages is divided into two. One is the prose section, and the second is the verses that repeat the principles of the prose. Well, we're in the verses, and we're about to finish them. So what I've done to, uh, in order to get the most out of this part of the text, I've taken the last, uh, each of the verses, that is, as they arise, and then gone back into the prose from that particular stage to sample again, to serve up, to dish out the, the banquet of Dharma contained in each of those prose sections even though we went line by line as we came through them the first time, the, uh, you, no way we could plumb the very bottom of what's available to us in terms of Dharma principles, stories, parables, allegories, uh, methods for tech, you know, techniques for cultivation, uh, instructions for how to emulate this bodhisattva. You can't do it even with a detailed, slow-going analysis, as slow as, slowly as we went. Today, as I was uh, reviewing what I wanted to share, it was like, wow, I don't even remember, don't even remember lecturing on that the first time through. So what a joy to be able to uh, bring it up again. And uh, we're gonna, because we're not in the pro section, we're in the verses section. So we're not gonna go in detail, but we are going to definitely uh, scan the tops of the waves to give us the highlights. 
So with that in mind, that's our method, that's our technique. Um, I'm going to look for page 88 when we're back. But meanwhile, we're going to scan all the way to, here we are, thumbnails. We're going to go back to the top. There it is. And bring it up so people can actually see it. And we're going to chant an invocation. We're going to invoke, we're going to invite the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly and all of the Dharma protectors to draw near, to bless us, to lend their light to this enterprise and to uh, generally make us feel connected and happy. That's, that's uh, my experience when I was first exposed to, the, to a Mahayana Sutra, Sutra lecture by Master Shren Hua. It, was, it always felt like you had joined a global family uh, of beings, visible and invisible. It was quite a startling uh, realization that a lot of the reality that is happening around us is not on a visible wavelength. So of, of uh, radio on the radio electronic no, spectrum, right? Is that it? So here we go. Um, Seven times. Here we go. Namo Ga Fang Guang Fu Ba Yan Jing Ba Yan Hai Hui O Fu Sa Namo Ga Fang Ba Yan Jing Ba Yan Hai Hui O Fu Sa. down in Victoria. I hope the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas feel welcomed. A little bit of lilt that a five-string banjo gives to, to every tune. Um, back to page 88 here. Let's see where we landed. 86, not bad. Okay, 86, 80, 88, there we are. Looking over to, okay, we're down two more. <clears throat> this is our verse today. It's right here. It starts with Yi Wei Miao Zhi, Guan Zhong Sheng, that one. Okay, now, um, because these are verses and the verses were chanted, not recited, we're going to toss just the barest minimum of a tune a melody on top of the verses so that we kind of get the sense of the, the uh, metered verses are actually different from the prose. And they carry very terse information. It's very crystallized, very compressed. So our job is to add some hot water to it and have it expand and let the flavor come out into the cup. So. Here we go. I'll give you a line, you give it back to me. Is that big enough to see? Can you see it, Sam? Okay, here we go. Yi wei miao zhi guan zhong sheng. Yi wei miao zhi guan zhong sheng. 
秦衡，野火正出林。秦衡，野火正出林。微雨化其林去道，微雨化其林去道。言说诸佛声一藏，言说诸佛声一藏。Okay, using subtle, marvelous wisdom, he regards sentient beings. Using subtle, marvelous wisdom, he regards sentient beings. Their habits of mind. Karmic delusions, dense as thickets. Their habits of mind, karmic delusions, dense as thickets. To teach them how to approach the way, to teach them how to approach the way, he proclaims the Buddha's treasury of sublime meanings. He proclaims the Buddha's treasury. Of sublime meanings. Okay, we have reached the ninth wisdom, and I want to say to everybody who's here, congratulations. Be you here physically, as our our、uh, masculine community here today at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm here in the Buddha Hall has gathered to look into the Flower Garland Sutra and our global, worldwide community on. YouTube, on Instagram, and on what? What is our? What are we using in China? Is 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 it Instagram? Is it Zoom? Using Zoom? Okay, Zoom to bring in、uh, not quite a hundred folks in China. We're we're hoping to get to a hundred at some point. But these are people who have come from all over China.、Uh, the amazing diversity of provinces who are listening now to our volunteers. Kind-hearted translation into Mandarin, but、uh, the hundred and usually one hundred and sixty, one hundred and fifty folks who are with us on YouTube truly come from around the globe. We have people listening in from、uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and from Switzerland, and from Singapore, and from Malaysia, and from all over California and Florida. We have them listening in from Sydney to Melbourne to I don't think we've ever had anybody from Perth. We'll have to remedy that. Uh, okay, Alex, you head out to Perth and dial in next week, and、we'll, that way we can make the claim. So, yeah, all over. Yeah. So,、um, indeed, this is.、Uh, I want to say congratulations for coming to to this gathering today. Because why? The ninth stage of the tenth stages of the Dasha Bumi chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra. Is rare and special. It's hard to hear this. It is not often put into the air. So、um, let's review what we got. Our bodhisattva is using subtle, marvelous wisdom to look at living beings, looking at their habits of mind, their karmic delusions, which the sutra says is makes them as dense as thickets. To teach them how to approach the way, he proclaims the Buddha's treasury of sublime meaning. Now, is that a slam of living beings? Absolutely, it is. The Bodhisattva is a living being. Plus, he's a value-added living being. The Bodhisattva is connected, just the way a lotus has its roots deep in the mud, but that pure blossom. Rises up、uh, unsullied above the mud, so the bodhisattva's wisdom is the same way. But he's rooted in living beings. He knows us. He knows himself, herself. So he is clear that mostly we don't get it, and human beings among the various living beings represented here are <clears throat> one of the most benighted species. Breathing on the planet, my goodness, we think too much, we reflect not enough, and we tie ourselves in knots、uh, politically, socially, economically.、Uh, we foul our nest. 
right? We are one of the few species who really do, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep my language uh, suitable, uh, a G rating, right? But we, uh, we find it very hard to, to do things that truly benefit ourselves and others at the same time. So the Bodhisattva says, dense as thickets. What does it mean to be dense as thickets? And what is that? That's a, uh, an image from the Buddha Sutras describing how our minds are just so complex and so rooted in what are called xie qian, false views, wrong views. We see things the way they're not. We see things the way they aren't and believe it to be the case, right? And then we compound that and we, we give ourselves reasons for why the untruth that we cling to is the case, right? So I have a, and, and to say, okay, with that in mind, the Bodhisattva says, your karmic delusions are just legend. They're so uh, thick and impenetrable. And for that reason, I have to teach you how to approach the way. <laughs> he doesn't give up. That's what we learned last week, all of those uh, uh, last time. And by the way, I, uh, I, was, I had two bhikshus lecture on my behalf last week because I had what was called a rhinovirus. Anybody have a rhinovirus? Is that different than a hippo virus, I suppose, or an elephant virus? I don't know. But this rhinovirus, I was tested for COVID last week by my kind-hearted uh, local doctor uh, supporter, uh, support, medical support, Dr. Kevin. And Kevin took my, uh, took my COVID test over to the local lab, which, by the way, isn't very busy, I must say. Uh, knock on wood here. But my results came back quickly because there wasn't a huge backlog of COVID tests. And it came back, nope, you don't have COVID virus, you got rhinovirus. And this big horn grew in my, like Pinocchio. No, I'm kidding about that part. So uh, it took seven days to recover from the rhinovirus. Oh my, uh, I get about one head cold a year and this was head cold. And I don't wanna say on steroids because we're talking about medicine. It wasn't head cold on steroids. It was a head cold that uh, knocked me down for seven days. So all better now, thank you. And very much appreciate the two bhikshus who truly, as they say, in the midst of a hundred busynesses, were able to step in and, and cover the lecture last week. So um, we're talking about uh, being as dense as thickets and having the Bodhisattva uh, read us the riot act. Are you familiar with that, that idiom? Uh, telling us what's wrong with us. And yet he doesn't quit. Uh, two weeks ago, we had all those, although, comma, 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 dot, colon, colon, dot, 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 even so, right? Although living beings are, we are so, uh, we do so many things that directly hurt ourselves, right? And even so, the Bodhisattva doesn't quit on us. I remember uh, when I was illustrating how living beings can do things directly that run directly counter to their own interests. I used the example of hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. And I was amazed that people didn't know that analogy, right? Uh, one test, Alex, you're a young guy. Have you heard the joke? Why are you hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? You know that one? See, the whole generational gap here. Anybody our age, like, right? Why are you, no, Rory, no? Ah, maybe it's an American thing. I must be an American, okay. So good, I get, well, I got some new material. Here we go, ready? Question, why are you hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? Answer, because it feels so good when I stop. Right, <laughs> just like, <laughs> okay, you, you all get the irony, okay, so. Question, that, that was considered, that was a kid's joke when I was growing up. You know, it's like, ha, ha, ha. You laugh at it the first time, not the 12th time. Why are you hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? So here's somebody taking a hammer, pounding it against their head. Obviously, you'd call that unwise, unskillful behavior. And the answer is, 
because when I stop, it feels good. So the question you would ask would be, what if you didn't hit yourself in the head with a hammer to begin with? You'd already be feeling good, right? Well, I, you know, bang, bang. So we human beings, we living be humans among the various living beings seem to be hitting ourselves in the head with a hammer, uh, burning our planet down. Uh, so the Bodhisattva says, yep, dense as thickets, <laughs> dense as thickets. And I didn't completely understand, I didn't have as many good analogies for dense as thickets until my first trip to England. By golly, uh, if you travel in rural England, you encounter something called hedgerows, hedgerows. And they were, I know, uh, hedgerows were considered, you know, people were saying, oh, it doesn't really matter if Hitler makes it across the English Channel, his panzer divisions will be defeated by the hedgerows, right? Hitler won't be able to run his tanks through England because the hedgerows are impenetrable. They'll stop even panzer tanks, tiger tanks. So what is a hedgerow? Uh, we Americans probably don't have that image as firmly as anybody who's ever traveled through, through England. But a dense thicket is when vegetation, bushes grow up so closely together that a person cannot walk through them. <clears throat> because the hedgerows in England are so old, and have been grown for so many years that often there will be one single lane road cutting through the countryside in England. And on to the left and to the right, there's this wall of greenery, this wall of vegetation that uh, birds can fly through it, rabbits can run through it, uh, small mammals can get through it, human beings and automobiles, mm -mm. much the less panzer tanks, I don't know. Maybe, Good. luckily we didn't have to test that theory. But I have a story about my own experience of dense thickets. And it goes like this. This is actually an illustrated story by golly. And it looks like this. Um, while I was bowing up the coast of California with my companion, former Hung Chao, uh, Dr. Verhoeven, we uh, noticed that on the, largely on the ocean side, we were on the Pacific Coast Highway, which is the farthest Western extension of the land mass of California for hundreds and hundreds of miles. So to the left was the ocean, Pacific Ocean. We would see these things. And that, we don't call it, a. you could call it a thicket. We were calling it a bramble because why? It was made up of berry vines, berry vines. And they were often blueberries. No, I'm sorry, wrong. They were often blackberries. Sometimes there were other varieties, right? Sometimes it would be uh, raspberries, you know, or black raspberries. Uh, later up in California, it becomes loganberries. Um, Olala berries sometimes. Olala berry pie, if you've never tried it, I recommend it. Grow in Oregon. But in general, they are these sweet, uh, many seeded, tiny seeded berries with lots of thorns, right? And when those thorns grow like this, it's called a bramble. That, my friends, is a dense thicket. In our sutra, the Bodhisattva says living beings' minds are like that. But my story and why these are, this is, this is a good illustration of berry vine brambles along the Pacific Coast Highway. Um, rabbits, birds, and bugs can live there, humans cannot. And the berries that grow on these brambles are not useful for people who would hope to turn them into blackberry jam or maybe raspberry muffins, right? Or pancakes or waffles, you make berry waffles? I don't think so. So not much value because why? The berries are green, they're small, they're sour. They never get ripe, juicy and sweet until 
Let me show you what they look like. Here they are. This is ripe berry fruit, right? Over here on the right, this green is when they're unripe. And boy, you don't want to bite down on an unripe blackberry. Or let's see here, barberry, bramble, raspberry, strawberry, right? Lots of berries. You want to wait till they're ripe. But if they're totally in a bramble, if they're in a dense thicket like living beings' minds, they're not flavorful and they're not very helpful. Likewise, we living beings with our minds like dense thickets don't have the fruit of wisdom and compassion the way one would hope when the berries come ripe. So as we proceeded along the coast, I remember it was somewhere in Big Sur, there was a lonely uh, house along the road and it was a wider stretch between the highway and the ocean. So somebody had built their house between the highway and the ocean. And it was a clever, skillful gardener. And he or she had built a trellis. Do you all know what a trellis is? It's a lattice work, a framework of, of vertical and horizontal strips that allow the berry vine to climb. And the berry vine climbed up the trellis and the skillful gardener had taken his or her pruning shears and had pruned away half or more of the stalks of the bramble. And the bramble had now become a healthy, growing, this is still, is this the, no, this is, this looks like a bramble, but this is because it's a the photograph compresses it, right? But he, had, he or she had pruned back more than half of the branches. And the result was the sunlight came in, the moisture irrigation coming up from the roots could nurture fewer berries and the berries grew ripe and tasty. And look at the butterfly, right? What the skillful pruned gardener created was delicious, ripe, sweet berries that became useful for people to enjoy. And the lesson when I saw that, it was like immediately I saw, ah, this is what happens when you take a dense thicket and turn it into vines is in the human, in our human lives, when we take the precept dharma and prune away all of the excess ram random desires in our minds, we get the fruit of clarity, clear thoughts, of well-considered ideas, of principled ideas, and the result of wise, well-disciplined ideas is compassionate action, right? We become a ripe human, just the way the, the dense thickets at the hands of a, of a gardener with their pruning shears became ripe fruit, right? It's like, oh yeah, now I see why. Sherpa would say, you know, it's good to cultivate. <laughs> cultivate precepts, concentration, and wisdom. If we take those precepts into our lives, if we listen to our bodhisattva advisors, we prune our actions, our speech, our thoughts. Not every single thought is a winner. Not every single word that comes out of my mouth is a gem, right? And often silence improves on careless, reckless, hurtful speech, right? So use those baseline, basic guidelines of the precepts, the fruit of our lives, be sweet and beneficial to the world. Okay, I'll get that. So that's my story about dense thickets. And man, oh man, they're on the Pacific Coast Highway. I could just see when a skillful gardener 
snip, 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 snip. And you follow the guidelines of basically that arise out of kindness and the principle of what ahimsa, non-harming. Right? You look at those precepts, excuse me, <coughs> of cherishing life instead of killing, of cherishing generosity and sufficiency instead of stealing, of cherishing fidelity to the promises we make, to the vows that we take instead of adultery or promiscuity, right? Cherishing integrity and truthfulness in our speech instead of lying and cherishing clarity and wisdom instead of the temporary high and the, <laughs> the lengthy hangover of intoxication. Oh my goodness, you know, life goes well and may not be the high followed by the low and the high followed by the low, but life lived this way is a life that can actually transcend selfishness, self-benefit and the dense thicket of the up and the down and the up and the down, right? Okay, you get the idea. So our bodhisattva is on the ninth stage and look at what, okay, I went back to the ninth stage, to the text. Oh, oh come back here, come back here, come back here. And I'm gonna make that a little bigger. You could probably make that bigger. There we go. On the ninth stage, oh man, our bodhisattva is called a da fa shir. And I thought, da fa shir. So da, that word, here, let's do it. We're learning Mandarin as we go, aren't we? So da fa shir. Is that, let's see, where is the shir character? Number one, there you go. He's a da fa shir. So this character right here, I'll make those bigger so you can see him. It's, it's a really interesting character because it looks like somebody who's standing like this, right? It's a person with his arms extended out and he's big. So the word da here with the fourth tone means big, right? Da. So I thought a big Dharma master, you want to be a big Dharma master? Some of the best Dharma masters I've known are like, don't even crack five feet. You know, they're like, Master, uh, uh, Master Hai Dung was about 5'3", 50 times champion of all China martial arts competitions. Master Hai Dung, he was maybe, I think maybe 5'4", I think. Didn't, so he was, but he was a Da Fasher. And his specialty was, among other things, the thing that made him most famous was what was called yi zhi chan gong, the ability to do a one finger stand. All right, you tough commando, <laughs> show me your one finger stand, you know. How about a two fingers? No, one, and I saw him do it, I saw him do it. His, actually, his, his right hand index finger was a little bit bulbous, can you say? It was a little thicker than, an, or, than any of his other digits but it came from being able to invert his body onto one finger and hold it, right? And the rest of his body was upside down. Not, you think of a handstand or a headstand. Can you do a one handstand, a four, a three, two, a one finger stand? He did it on one finger. And he, to this day, uh, it's hard to find anybody who is equal to that. He could do it. So this is an unusual monk, unusual monk. He had the other ability, one of his Kung Fu, he had many different styles of Kung Fu, which he brought back to Shaolin Monastery. Master Hai Dung was the, uh, uh, the reviver of Shaolin Monastery, and he brought back all these rare and special uh, martial, martial arts methods, including one called Tong Zi Gong, the skill of the virgin boy, right? Tongzi is, a, is a, an innocent child, prepubescent boy. Uh, could be a girl too, Tongzi Gong, but a young boy before puberty. 
And he said, oh, this Tong Zigong, are you still, are you celibate? Uh, that's, I only take, cel I only teach that one to someone who has no outflows, you know? And it's like, well, uh, how many people is that, you know? Is that so, but the, the one that was, uh, the one that contributed to his 50 consecutive victories in martial arts contests as a monk, right? Was one called Pai Da Gong. Pai da Gong the skill of Pai Da Gong is you can't knock him down. Can't knock him down. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad brought, bought me and my brother, Joe Paluka. That's American, right? Joe Paluka. Joe Paluka, he was a, a uh, the Chinese have a, a name for Bu Dao Wong, Yeah, it's a, uh, it was a punching bag with a heavy bottom that you couldn't, every time you punched it, it would come back up. You'd knock it down and come back up. That was Joe Paluka. And uh, Master Haidung had a skill that was Joe Paluka. Now, when he came to America uh, at the request of invitation of Master Xuanhua, uh, Master Haidung, um, went on to the stage of the, I forget the name of the theater in Chinatown, San Francisco. It was the, you know, the screening the old film that it was a community theater in San Francisco and uh, came with a baseball bat. And I was translating on stage. And uh, he said, okay, you tell him out there. The, 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 whole, the audience is full because he's a famous one. And it was the screening of the film called uh, Shaolin Haidong Yipian Dianyi, right? Shaolin Haidong, Master Haidong of Shaolin Temple. That was the film, the documentary that was being screened. And so there he was in person on the stage from China. This is just a few years after the Cultural Revolution. So, okay. So <laughs> Master Haidong, took the baseball bat and said, ask anybody uh, to come on up, anybody who wants to give me a whack. So I said, well, <laughs> uh, anybody like to hit Master Haidung with a baseball bat? <laughs> and everyone's like, you know, do we hear that right? He says, yeah, yeah. So Haidung points, he says, you, you over there. He said, invite him up. And who was it? A fireman from the local firehouse, <laughs> burly, burly guy, you know? And hi, Dunkel, you over there. Who's this guy? This guy's an active duty Marine uh, on a weekend off, you know, <laughs> an active duty Marine who's strong man, you know? And he brings a third guy up, he brought a policeman up. So we had a policeman and a fireman and a, and a Marine on stage and he hands him the, the bat, he says, hit me. <laughs> They're like, I, no, we, we came to learn Buddhism. We can't, we can't hit you. Hit me, he said. And so the policeman says, well, this is, he said, uh, no, you're not. He said, I'm indemnified, right? There's no, no liability, right? He said, I, I, I don't want to be sued. No, 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 I mean it. He says, anywhere above, above the neck, uh, below the neck, below, just don't hit my head. He said, but anywhere below the neck. So the guy, well, all right, takes the baseball bat, whacks the monk. And the monk absorbs the blow somehow and takes one step back and goes, Paul, I have a sister who hits harder than that. <laughs> you know, he hands the bat to the fireman. And the fireman <laughs> wails away. Master Haidung takes a step back and says, were you trying? Try harder. Gives it to the Marine. And the Marine, you know, winds up, whack. They hit him half a dozen times. And Master Haidong just takes a step back because the kinetic force pushed him back. And he's five feet four in, in his monk's robe. And they go, they all say, I don't know what he, what, what's going on with this monk, but we can't seem to not only not injure him, we can't knock him over. He says, yep. He said, anybody else out there? And everyone's going, nope, <laughs> that's enough, nope. He said, thank you, the three of you, please return to your seats. So that's Pai Dagong. And he explained it later 
which is he's able to move his chi anywhere on his body that he chooses. And it, it's an air barrier. It might as well be a, 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 some sort of a, you know, a, might as well be a bolster, like a, a pillow of air that can absorb any blow and not be knocked over. So no wonder Master Haidang won all those martial arts contests because you couldn't knock him over. He was Joe Paluka, the Buddha Wong, you know. So he's a famous, famous monk and, uh, re, you know, repeat, deservedly so. Master Hua invited him to America and asked him to explain the Lang Yinjing, the Sharangama Sutra. So I have, uh, along with Marty, uh, Master Haidung took one look at, at Hong Chao and said, Oh, uh, he, take a, a Lao Jiao Shou. He says, Lao Jiao Shou, old professor, he called him. Old professor, right away. And Marty had a black belt in Taekwondo, you know, and he was tough. He was recruited by the Air Force Academy to be their football quarterback, a uh, half, uh, halfback. And be a halfback. He didn't go, but they wanted him to to play halfback on the the uh, Air Force football team, Air Force Academy, you know, in Colorado. Didn't sign with him. Went to Wisconsin instead. But Marty was a tough character, and uh, Master Hai Dong looked at him and said, "Oh, Lao Jiao Shou," he said. "Did you miss your calling?" He said. Uh, and and so Marty was like, mm, you know. So Hai Deng was teasing him to get him to step into martial arts, again, as a monk. And uh, so we have many, many stories about our three days, three days encounter with Master Hai Deng. But Marty, who, uh, whose eyes are tuned to martial skill, I, I have ear skills, I'm a translator. Marty doesn't, he speaks one language, English, but he, his visual acuity, his, his eyes are very sharp. He could tell in a single move where your strengths and weaknesses are. So he was watching Hai Dung just so carefully. And he said his lasting impression to this day of the entire visit. And we went to the airport to greet Hai Dung and his entourage, including the filmmakers and his disciples. And, all. and uh, we were with him every, every day until he left. Uh, but he said his single lasting impression of Master Hai Deng was in San Francisco, we were on the way to the theater to do this and count this uh, uh, demonstration of his toughness. And he said, we were standing at, we were crossing the street about at a green light at, across in Chinatown. And I was to the side, so I didn't see this. Marty's martial artist eyes. He said, Master Hua, Shifu, was behind Master Hai Deng. And he walked up to him, picked him up and set him on the curb. And Master Hai Deng never saw it. <laughs> and Hai Deng was like, <laughs> because he's, you know, he's the sensitive martial artist. You're, you're aware of blow, you know, and Shifu went behind him and kind of picked him up and set him on the curb like that, you know, <laughs> snuck up on him and lifted him off the ground and out of the street and put him on the curb. And Hai Deng was, oh, and then he laughed because he never saw it. The move was too fast and too powerful. What did he do? He picked him up and set him down, you know. So Shifu, you know, like it was Dharma combat, but in, in a brotherly way. But it, Marty said he couldn't believe it, that Shifu snuck up on Hai Deng, picked him up and set him. I didn't even, I wouldn't have noticed it. I didn't, you know, but it was like, like that. And Hai Deng was, oh, you got me. You got me, you know. So amazing, amazing. So who is the Da Fa Shi? Don't measure it in feet and inches or centimeters, right? It's not how tall you are. It's your skill. So I translated in this case, thinking big Dharma master, great 
Dharma Master, great is over, great, great is like awesome. It has lost its greatness. Awesome, the word has lost its awesomeness, right? It's just too common now. Our favorite story, got to do it. David Rounds, our late colleague as a translator, went into the, the uh, what's, what's the, the uh, Ukiah coffee shop? Black Oak, Black Oak Coffee Roasters, and said, I would like a uh, soy latte. And the barista said, awesome, handed him his coffee. So when a soy latte rivals the sutra or the Dharma master for awesomeness, it's time to retire awesome as our translation of great. So I was thinking the excellent Dharma master. How about that? Excellent. Meaning, look what hides inside excellent is excel. Is it two L's? To excel. Never mind the spreadsheet. That's not Microsoft can't steal our word. Right? But the excellent Dharma master surpasses. Right? <coughs> Goes beyond the norm. Is excellent. He excels. Uh, other Dharma masters. So this is our ninth stage Bodhisattva who excels his peers. He is excellent in his ability to communicate. That's what comes up over and over in the ninth stage. After he reads out living beings as being dense thickets, and there's 10 varieties of dense thickets their afflictions are dense thickets. Their views are dense thickets, right? Um, he looks at our text. Let's see here. All right. Our text talks about, what am I looking for here? Looking for the other. All right. There it is. He looks at attributes of living beings. And oh my goodness, there are so many xiang attributes. Zhong zhong xiang. The attributes of living beings is what he looks at. And there was there were so many, so many attributes. I remember we went through. Um, and the bodhisattva, what happened to him next? Um, here we, this is what I'm looking for. Um, okay, here we are. This is what I want to share. So I'll look at the Chinese first to help the translator out. See how compassionate I am. Okay, here we go. Fozi Pusa Sui Shun Lu Shi Shi Hui Ming Zhu Shan Hui. This is the ninth stage. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva who accords with wisdom like this, is able to abide on the stage of wholesome wisdom. Once he or she abides upon this stage, he knows thoroughly the differences in sentient beings' practices. Then he can teach them and attune them and help them attain liberation. Okay, so all of these, he looks at dozens and dozens of attributes. What that means is what makes this person or this being different from another. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm aware of this reality um, every single day when I feed the birds. Uh, what are attributes? Well, animals relate to food, uh, certainly. And among the birds who show up on my deck are carnivores and seed eaters, right? And I learned, we've all learned over there as, as we get to know them, that uh, one cup of bird seed is is approached differently by many, many different species of birds differently, right? So for example, first ones to show up in the morning usually are the currawongs. And the currawongs 
are omnivores. They can eat meat and other birds, babies. They can do that, but they're very happy with apple slices. Give a currawong an apple slice and he flies away with it in his beak and impales it on a branch and starts to chew on it. It's very, and yet at the same time, currawongs love crackers. And the, the poly want a cracker, currawong want a cracker. I crack off a piece of a saltine, throw it in the air, and the currawong meets it at mid arc, grabs it, and flies back down. Toss another one, grabs it, you know. And I play catch with my currawongs. Boy, the San Francisco Giants should sign up these currawongs in center field. They are so good at catching, you know, before the, 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 cracker, cr the cracker chunk reaches the top of its apogee, perigee, the, the currawong is grabbed in midair and lands back down for the another piece. They're happy with crackers, but they're also happy with the porridge that I make for the lorikeets. So you feed the lorikeets porridge and the currawongs are over there dipping their beaks, and holding their throat up and then they dip their beaks. Right? So the currawongs are, are omnivores. But then who comes next are the lorikeets. And the lorikeets are wannabe omnivores, but you don't, they're, they're more like they want to be bullies. So anything you feed another bird, they want it. Doesn't matter what it is, eat it or not, they want it. Well, they will eat apples for sure, but, and they will eat bird seed, but they shouldn't. They're nectar eaters. They have special furry tongues that pulls pollen off of plants. They're nectar eaters. They're a special kind of bird, but they will eat bird seed, Till they stuff their bellies. So we mix up, you know, we mix up porridge for them. Slightly sweet. They're in the honey eater variety. So there they are. And then after that, who comes next? Ah, the scrub turkeys. And the scrub turkeys will eat the corn, dried corn kernels that none of the other birds will touch out of the bird seed. So the, the, the scrub turkeys, there's so many now. We have so many every day that they are, I have to go out and refill the bowl three times a day. And following them come the king parrots. And the king parrots love sunflower seeds. Oh my goodness. And they're so good at cracking them, you know. And then after that come the pigeons and the pigeons eat everything. And whatever's left after the, well, the pigeon, I take it back. They don't eat wheat. The pigeons don't, nobody likes the wheat except the possums at night who come and clean up the bowl. So what you learn is all these different critters have different palates. And if you feed this food to that, the wrong bird, they don't want it. They can't eat it. It's not nourishment for them. So like Confucius said, uh, he said, there are no living beings who fail to flourish if you provide their proper nutrition, right? So if you can give the right food to the right living being, they will all flourish. And that's an attribute. Bodhisattva looks at living beings and goes, wow, yeah, they're so different. I see, I can teach them this one this way, but it won't work for that one. So I have to teach that one that way. And now he has the wisdom to do all that. What we run into next in the ninth stage is what are called four kinds of eloquence. I don't know if you recall when we went through but there are four ways that the Bodhisattva takes his wisdom, his knowledge of living beings attributes and a huge long list of all the different qualities that beings have. The Bodhisattva knows what works for this one or that one or this group and he explains it for them. He uses his eloquence, eloquence in Dharma, eloquence in phrasing, right? Eloquence in uh, grammar or eloquence in joy in speech. Oh, that's the best one, right? So let's see here. Look at this. In all, I'll, I'll show you in Chinese first so you can know what I'm saying. Help out the translator. Shan Nang Yan Shuo Sheng Wen Cheng Fa Sheng Wen Sheng Sheng Fa Fa Du Jue Sheng Fa Pu Sa Sheng Fa Ru Lai Di Fa Yi Chie Heng Chu Zhi Sui Xing 
故，能随众生根、性、欲、结所行有意，逐具差别，一岁受生、烦恼、免福、主业习气而为说法，令生信结，增益智慧，故与其圣而得解脱。Look at this. In all of his dharma practices, because his wisdom corresponds with their practices, he is able to speak dharma for sentient beings to match their faculties, their natures, their preferences, and understandings. He matches their differences in practice, their differing realms of rebirth, and according with the rebirths they undergo, their afflictions, their blindnesses and fetters. And he speaks for them according with their karma and their habits. He helps them bring forth faith and understanding. To increase their wisdom, so that each one individually achieves liberation in the context of their own vehicle. Man, oh man, what a skill! Right? Look at how wisdom is used by the Bodhisattva. If you you think about what what challenges arise in simple communication. With people in your own family, how easy it is to misunderstand or to take offense when we hear certain words.、Uh, to certain words will prod us into violence. You know, just insult somebody's mom. Yo mama jokes, right? Yo mama so fat. No, don't do it. So it's like if words are plenty to create. Physical conflict among people. Other words, right? You can become a non-person. <laughs> I won't mention China.、Uh, yeah, censorship in certain dic dictatorial dictatorships will throw you and get you in jail. You know, we are like that. Communication is so hard, right? Look at the Bodhisattva who uses. The four types of unobstructed eloquence on the stage of wholesome wisdom, the ninth stage, and proclaims the Dharma the way bodhisattvas do. What are those four kinds? The wisdom of Dharma, wisdom in phrasing, wisdom in meaning. That's the one I left out. And then the wisdom of delight in speech. Those are the si da si zhong bian cai wu ai wu ai bian cai. That's what the Bodhisattva can use, and now the Sutra gives us paragraph after paragraph of what it means to say four kinds of eloquence. Look at this. This is what we went through when we went line by line. All these kinds of joy, joyful speaking, and all of this is to introduce what something called Tolongi, Dharani. Dharani is a Sanskrit word. By itself, it means a mantra. So, if you say the Great Compassion Dharani, that's a noun. That's the name of one particular mantra. But there's another explanation of this word Dharani, which is it's a state. It's a a cultivated accomplishment. It's a level of accomplishment where the things you say. Have the effect of a mantra, of a dharma, so that sounds take on meanings that communicate. All right. So, at this point, let's see here. What does our bodhisattva do?、Uh, okay. Yep. Here we go. This is the first time this term appears. Disciples of the Buddha. The bodhisattva who abides on the ninth stage gets unobstructed wisdom of expedient skills, gets the Tathagata's storehouse of wondrous dharma, and becomes an excellent dharma master. Right? For the Pusa Ju Di Jiu Di, the Ru Shi Shan Qiao Wu Ai Zhi, the Ru Lai Miao Fa Zang Zuo Da Fa Shi. Okay, that's where it happens. Okay, let's look at the Chinese first, and we'll go to the English. 德意陀罗尼，法陀罗尼，智陀罗尼
，光照陀罗尼，善慧陀罗尼，仲裁陀罗尼，威德陀罗尼，无爱门陀罗尼，无边际陀罗尼。种种意陀罗尼，如是等百万恶生起陀罗尼门，皆得圆满，以百万恶生起善巧音声辩才门而言说法。Okay, here we go. What's going on here? He gets the dharani of meanings, the dharani of dharmas, the dharani of wisdom, the dharani of lights, the dharani of wholesome wisdom, the dharani of multitudes of riches. Dharani of awesome virtue, the dharani of gateways to non-obstruction, the dharani of boundlessness, and the dharani of myriad meanings. He gets the perfection of hundreds of thousands of sankhyas of gateways of dharani like these, and he proclaims the dharma using hundreds of thousands of sankhyas of gateways to eloquence with skillful, expedient voices. Okay, so this is the ninth stage. All right, and the deal with the ninth stage is the We've been following this bodhisattva and trying to identify that this is a person like you, like me, who cultivates, who has gone step by step successively into advanced levels of meditation. And with this, his current level of meditation, this skill, this latent ability opened up to him or her. It's not that. This is some sort of, you know,、uh, alien being from another realm, or is a Marvel Comics creation superhero? Not. This is a human being who has this potential coded into your consciousness, into your Jungians would say subconscious. It's not yet conscious. It is pre-conscious. But it is latent. It's there. It's waiting to be activated. Just the same way, you know. Here's a mundane comparison. If you、uh, have on your computer, let's say Adobe Photoshop, if that's too far out, maybe just even Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word, let's say, has in it potentials that probably 90% of the users never touch, right? Uh, not praising it, I personally don't use Microsoft Word. I consider it bloated. I prefer Nice's Writer, but Microsoft Word has functions that, in a lifetime of use, we will never touch. Right? It's just so extensive. Right? The human mind has in it all these potentials, including Dharani. We may never touch it, but it's there. That's the point I want to make. Is this is not. Long ago and far away, it's in us right this minute. But the bodhisattva and the ten the ten stages describes a person who made this a priority to open, and they did it step by step, gradually, right, progressively, opening up until now it works. And what's it about? It's about communication. The Bodhisattva wants to help us wake up, and it is a tool. Man, Dharani as a tool for communication. Holy mackerel!、Um, okay,、uh, let's see here. Can you guide me in the Buddhist path? I am a Hindu, and I want to convert to Buddhism. Is a question from YouTube. <laughs> With deep respect. No, <laughs> I won't. I would much rather that you, if if this person is in earnest, and I slightly skeptical,、um, I would much rather that you become a better Hindu, and right within your Hindu community, bring harmony, <coughs> capacity, bring ahimsa to flower. Right within the 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 Hindu ness of your friends and family, who was the who was the prince? The prince was. It's hard to say because Hindu is a name that many people from the religions of Mahabharata, right, do not claim. 
Hinduism is a Western word. It's a kind of a, an Orientalism. It's a term applied on this gray body of teachings of folks who, you know, follow Vishnu, follow Shiva, uh, follow Ram, you know, follow Ganesha, a polytheistic world, uh, an ecosystem with many, 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 many gods, all bringing their, their light and their wisdom and their practices together in Mother India, right? So I am closest to the Swamis of the Ramakrishna mission, the Vedanta Swamis. And I don't think there are any Vedanta Swamis who would say that their chosen practices are deficient uh, in terms of it, it, compared to Buddhism. So I would encourage you to investigate further, go deeper into the roots of your own faith. Uh, it's possible that the current political wing uh, in the Dharma ending age, Hinduism and politics has kind of come up with a very bitter stew that seems to be narrowing and narrowing and narrowing to the exclusion of Muslims, for example. Um, the, you know, I'm not gonna, that, that's hotly, hotly contested their lives at stake in this discussion. So I think if the Hinduism practiced in India currently can expand, don't, instead of rejecting it, go deeper into it, you know, uh, take those roots and explore, find out what's wrong with Hinduism as practiced and make it right, right within the, the glory of the Vedas, you know, and the Mahabharata and all those profoundly, those, those are faiths from the roots of humanity, right? So I would much rather you do that. And if you really, you know, you can be a Hindu who meditates, who is compassionate, who is kind, who practices the, the Panchashila and uh, bless the world right from within Hinduism. Besides, Master Hua didn't want people to label themselves Buddhists. He wanted people to investigate wisdom. So if you can be a very wise Hindu, you don't even have to call yourself a Hindu. If you could be a wise Buddhist, you don't have to call yourself a Buddhist, right? You can be a person of wisdom and compassion. That's what the world needs right now. All right, so never mind the labels. Get to the heart of it. Okay, look what happens in the ninth stage here. Okay, uh, the Bodhisattva communicates. He communicates. Oh my, look what happens. When this Bodhisattva takes his seat of Dharma, he can, with a single utterance, bring everyone gathered there to understand. I will say one thing. Oh my. If only, if only, right? Imagine, imagine what people can do when they pull together and look at the mischief and the tragedy that happens when people pull apart. Looking at you, American Congress, right? My goodness, yeah. Let's come on, people now, smile on your brother. Everybody get together. Try and love one another right now, right? Okay, look at this amazing, amazing story. Uh, <coughs> the Bodhisattva at the ninth stage with the power of Dharani is able to go, ah, or Amitofo, or Om Shanti. Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om. 
right? Or he can say, what else? He can say something like, uh, bless you, you know, or God bless, or amen, right? Or hallelujah, or bodhisattva, a single utterance. And everybody within the sound of his or her voice wakes up. He uses myriad utterances to bring everybody in the crowd to awakening, says the sutra. All right, now, is that hyperbole? The sutra has never been hyperbolic, right? It's never exaggerated. It is still an instruction manual. This is the science of science, right? This is the uh, empirical of empiricism. At times, he radiates great light to express Dharma practice methods. Sometimes he uses the sounds of Dharma that come out of the skin pores of his body. Other times he makes objects formed and formless throughout the threefold large world system speak Dharma. Sometimes he makes one sound that goes throughout the Dharma realm and everybody hears it, right? At other times he makes sounds, all sounds whatsoever become sounds of Dharma, abiding constantly and never stopping. I mean, the sutra is like going out there now, describing what this bodhisattva can do with sound, right? To speak Dharma. He is a communicator, a great communicator, All right? I highlighted this one because I like this one particularly. Let's see what it says in Chinese here. Sometimes he makes the musical sounds in all worlds, be they reeds, flutes, bells, drums, or songs and hymns, express the sounds of the Dharma. Notice it doesn't say banjo. It didn't say banjo. I didn't see it anywhere say banjo, but I wish it had said banjo. Nonetheless, the, uh, here's the bodhisattva using music to speak the Dharma. And I love it that, you know, back when the sutra was spoken, let's say 2,500 years ago, reeds would be woodwinds, flutes are end blown and and uh, transverse blown, and bells made of metal, I assume, or stone, drums with skins, or just a cappella, the human voice, songs and hymns. So sacred music and popular music, pianos, or pianos mentioned here, Steinways, right? Nine foot Hamburg Steinways, express the sound, the sounds of Dharma, right? So every note from the 88 keys of the keyboard, from turning the pianist into a vessel, kind of like a clear crystal vase, so that the music of the composers passes through the pianist and with a single the skill of cultivated dharani, those fingers turn the instrument into a speaker, uh, a turn, turn the human fingers on the instrument of the piano into an instrument that communicates directly to the heart of living beings and tells them what they need to know to answer their problems, to understand what they didn't understand before, to overcome their fears, their limitations, their doubts, their obstacles, and to wake up. Now, I'm gonna scan on down here. Ready? Now, this is, this is out there, all right? This one requires a little bit of stretch to get to it, but I love it when the Avatamsaka gives us, paints a picture for us, does a skit. This is a skit, all right? Look. Goes down to Arts Delights. Okay, here it is. For the Zi Pusa, Jia Shi, Sanqian, Da Qian Shi Jie, Suo Yu Zheng Sheng, 
贤智其前，一一且以无量言音而性问难，一一问难，个个不同。菩萨与一念情，悉能灵受，仍以一因普为解释，令随心要，各得欢喜。OK， ready? Check it out. Disciples of the Buddha suppose all of the sentient beings of the threefold, large, thousand-world universe came into the presence of this bodhisattva, and then suppose each of them were to use limitlessly many words to pose troubling questions, and suppose that each troubling question were unique. The bodhisattva could receive them all in a single thought. Further, he would need only one utterance to answer them all, and make them each joyful in accordance with their hearts' delights. <laughs> this, this, this. I've never. The first time I read this, I was so delighted with this image, because I'm I am a language person. Uh, like today in the, um, Madalena Tam's、uh, series called "What a Shirful," my teacher. We had a、uh, the the opportunity to listen to Dr. Shneshana Akpinar, the just retired Chancellor of Dharma and Buddhist University, who referred to herself as a linguist, a language person. Why she reads or speaks ten separate languages, including Arabic, including Latin and Greek, including Sanskrit. And her dad had more languages. Her father,、uh, Dr. Veljezik. Who became、uh, uh, Bikshu Yanojibiko when he became a Buddhist monk? Spoke more languages than his daughter. Right? Communicators, linguists. Here's our Bodhisattva, who, in a situation according to the Sutra, has threefold large thousand world systems, numbers of living beings. That's a lot of living beings. Come into his presence,、uh, get him, you know, on WhatsApp、uh, or WeChat or Line. Or text, right? And maybe Facebook Messenger, and each one of them challenges him with a problem, a trick question, a wunnan, right? A question that is meant to to confuse or challenge or trouble, right? And the Bodhisattva, in a single thought, hears every one of them. Chia nang ling shou. Right, hears them all. Furthermore, not only does he hear each and every challenging question, but he goes ah,、uh, or amitofo, or praise. Fill in your saint, Jesus, praise Jesus, or Om Shanti, right? Amen. Whatever he says, one sound, and everyone who hears that sound. Goes, oh! Now I understand. <laughs> They all go. I get it. Wow, that's wonderful. And they're made delighted and satisfied, each in accordance with their hearts' delight. When I read that, I thought, man, oh man, if only, if only, how hard it is to communicate, even, you know. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So, yeah, that's the ninth stage. That's our bodhisattva. So,、uh, let's review one more time the、uh, what the text was just today. It said, "Using subtle, marvelous wisdom, he regards sentient beings." Their habits of mind, their karmic delusions, dense as thickets, to teach them how to approach the way, he proclaims the Buddha's treasury of sublime meanings. So, what a communicator our Bodhisattva is on the ninth stage! He is an excellent Dharma master, right? And can you imagine? I mean, <clears throat> how satisfying it must be to be. That Dharma master to realize that the things you say actually connect.、Um, people say, people ask me, you know, what 
what makes you happy? I remember having that question once, what makes you happy? And my answer was always, the thing that made me the happiest was the uh, 25 years that I spent at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery every Saturday night, without exception, unless I wasn't in the building or was sick or something. I was sitting on the stage the way I, I'm doing now here in the Gold Coast. And it would, I would be explaining sutras. And for many, maybe even, what, 19 of those 25 years, at the end, not that many, I guess, maybe 15, um, at the end of the sutra lecture at nine o'clock, from nine to 9.30 was story time. And story time was because we had a Sunday school, Saturday night Sunday school of young people. And we had young couples in our community who had kids. So we needed, so that the parents and the grandparents could come listen to the Dharma. We brought the kids along and they were in school in the dining room. And then at nine o'clock, they would all come in the Buddha hall and sit down right in front, right? Just for, tum, 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 tum. You know, here's Julia and here's Andrew and here's Christina and, you know, and I would, at some point during the week, I would walk up the hill to the Berkeley Public Library to the third floor back then before they renovated it. And they had this beautiful, beautiful children's section of the Berkeley Public Library, the downtown central branch. Oh man, they had every kid's book. And I would choom, choom, pull them out, scan them, looking for uh, the appropriate stories. And the best ones were always um, stories of heroes. If I could find an Asian kid as the hero, could it be a girl? Those are the ones I love. Uh, about the dragon up on the mountain who asks for a kid every, every year and uh, the boys are disappearing. And so there's one little girl, the Xiao Mei Mei, she's nine years old and she says, I love my brother. I don't want to lose him to a dragon. I'm going to go set that dragon to rights. You know, so she <laughs> charges up the hill this year and, and tames the dragon with kindness. You know? So those kind of stories. And as I would tell the stories, the kids sitting in the front row there would look up at me and go, fill me up, fill me up. I'm ready, you know. And there's this presentation. I want, we are hungry for stories. We're hungry for stories, right? And like in Philip Pullman's Dark Materials, when Lyra Silvertongue, Lyra Belacqua is down in the hills, in purgatory, actually, before the hells, it's telling all the ghosts about the world when you're embodied and the harpies who are out to obstruct Lyra and keep her there in the hells, they say to her, tell them stories. You must tell them true stories. If you can tell them the truth in stories, all will be well they say. And oh man, when I would tell this to the kids sitting there at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, there would be a moment when their eyes would go flash. That's my answer to the question, when are you happiest? When I see that flash in the eyes of someone listening to a story I'm telling, it means mm, connect. They got it. That's like... I feel like I've done my job. All right. So uh, with that in mind, uh, some of the best stories, um, some of the best songs come from literature. And uh, I am someone who likes to turn story into song and sing the story. And I found one the other day that I really, really like. And the song is called Here Comes That Rainbow Again. And I heard it from, learned this from Leo Kaki. Um, it's written by Chris Christopherson. Yeah, that Chris Christopherson, the movie star, who was a singer first. And, you know. and Chris Christopherson read Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. So did I. I read every single book Steinbeck ever wrote when I was growing up. I liked John Steinbeck. And Grapes of Wrath has a story where the Jode family, this is the story of the Dust Bowl. And 
the ground didn't grow crops in the Great Plains of the US. And the Okies from Oklahoma had to pack up their families, put them in the truck, including grandma in her wheelchair and in her rocking chair. Grandma's in the rocking chair. They didn't have wheelchairs back then. Rocking chair. And drive slowly towards the pastures of plenty of California. And there's this great scene in Grapes of Wrath where the Joad family's truck pulls up in a country store somewhere, maybe in the edge of Nebraska, or maybe it's even further. Maybe they've even gotten as far as Colorado. But it's a country store on a dirt road. And uh, that's actually, it's a, it's a fairly well-traveled. This is the main road. And, and of course, because of the Dust Bowl, thousands of families had to leave. So this road was now a bigger highway full of trucks and cars like the Jode family. You know, eight people in the truck and big mattresses down at the bottom so the kids could all sleep together down, down at the bottom of the truck. You know. So it's a country store and the truck stops. Pa gets out, goes to see if there's gasoline. He had come any money to buy some gas. And Ma gets out and tends to grandma and grandpa. And two of the five kids leap out of the bottom of the truck and go running inside of the country store to put their nose against the candy counter. And if you've ever been in a, I'm sure here in Australia, it's the same way. The old country stores had a white porcelain candy counter with a revolving lazy Susan type. And there were the cashews, the salted cashews and the jujubes with all the different colors and the good and plenty with the pink and the black and the white. And, uh, oh, I'm sure Australia had its own special candies. Everybody loved, you know, sour, sour saps. And, and there are these kids, they were looking at the penny candies. And I remember seeing these penny candies in country stores. They were uh, about as long as this bell, right? They were long, this long, and they were this big around, solid sugar, hard, you know? And if you, you couldn't, you couldn't bite one through, you had to lick it, but you could lick it all day. And you'd pass it on to your sister after you were done and she would lick it, you know? And so that's what these kids were looking at. And uh, there are two truck drivers sitting at a table finishing their coffee. And the person at the counter, probably a you know 19 year old daughter of the owner, might even be the owner himself, herself. And uh, so the, little, the two kids are staring, their eyes are just big enough, one's 10 and one's eight. And they're looking over the, watching the, the lazy Susan twirl around, you know, the different colors of the candies. And uh, so the kids say, how much are them candies? And the woman behind the counter says, how much have you got? She says, and the kids say, we've only a penny between us. Their eyes are as big as the plates in front of them. She says, well, them candies are two for a penny. She says. <laughs> And the kids hand the penny and it's got lint from their pocket, you know, and bubble gum and then they hand it over. And, and she goes, all right, here you go. Make sure you share with your sisters. You know, the kids grab the candy, zoom, and they're back in the truck, <laughs> licking on their, their all day sucker, you know. And so the truck drivers stand up from where they finish their coffee and uh, they say, hey, them candies ain't two for a penny. And the owner says, well, what's it to you? She says, right? And uh, the, the layers of meaning communicated. Well, what's it to you? She says, right? So the truck drivers you know, arrange the table, nod goodbye, go out the door. 
And the owner says, hey, hey, you left too much money on the table. The truck drivers say, so what's it to you? And out they go. Paying it forward, right? So here comes that rainbow again. It's the name of the song. Chris Christopherson took Steinbeck's story of kindness, of generosity, of paying it forward in the beauty that is in the human heart and caught it in this perfect song. And I just love, saw this the other day and I thought, man, communication is so precious. All right, so let me make this just a little bit bigger. Here we go. Literature into song, right? Story into song. The scene was a small roadside cafe. The waitress sweeping the floor. Two truck drivers drinking their coffee. Two oaky kids by the door. How much are them candies? They asked her. How much have you got? She replied. If only a penny between us. Them's two for a penny. She lied. The daylight grew heavy with thunder. With the smell of the rain on the wind. Ain't it just like a human? Here comes that rainbow again. Computer break. One truck driver called to the waiters after the kids went outside. Them candies ain't two for a penny. So what's it to you, she replied. Silence, they finished their coffee. They got up and nodded goodbye. She said, hey, you left too much money. So what's it to you? They replied. The daylight grew heavy with thunder. With the smell of the rain on the wind. Ain't it just like a human? Here comes that rainbow again. The daylight grew heavy with thunder, with the smell of the rain on the wind. Ain't it just like a human? Here comes that rainbow again. Communication is precious. So I would like to invite the Big Shoes, Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, to please uh, share with us the numerous things that are going on in the environment of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Who's going to hey. guide us through that? Amir Tofal. Good evening, everyone. So yes, we have many activities at Berkeley Monastery, a very active place oh, online. Yes. And so first, if you just look at the very top, we had to cancel a few activities because of um, we have two retreats. So first, we've canceled the 1230 to 1 p.m. Uh, uh, afternoon recitation tomorrow, Sunday and Monday, and also the three steps, one bow in the mornings, Sunday and Monday uh, for Memorial Weekend. The reason is because we have um, a retreat on the Brahma Viharas with Buddhist Global Relief, which you'll see right below that. And if you want, you could click the link and you can find the actual, the please sign up here and you'll see the actual, um, actual event. And this is at the Buddhist Global Relief website. 
Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and Aya Damadipa and Jing Weisher and myself are, are leading some of the programs. Um, so it's a chance to more deeply explore. We've been translated as the boundless hearts. Um, Brahma Vihara literally means the divine abodes. So I already started this today, but you can find the YouTube um, recordings online on their um, Buddhist Global Relief YouTube channel. Um, but welcome to join us. Jing Weisher and myself will be doing tomorrow afternoon's talk from 12 to 2 p.m. on compassion. And then the Monday talk, 12 to 1 on equanimity. Next um, event below is tomorrow morning, uh, we have the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit. This will go to 6 to 6.45. 6 to 6.45. Um, and so it's quite amazing that people have stayed consistent in their Great Compassion Mantra recitation over the last uh, year. year, over a year. Um, for um, people's well-being and the world during this difficult time. And I, I can't imagine anything better to do with our, you know, sheltered in place, maybe by ourselves, than recite the Great Compassion Mantra. Much better than just sitting by ourselves kind of frustrated is to actually connect with the heart of Great Compassion and dedicate it to the world. So please join us if you have time. Um, you can see there's a there's an a, there's a our regular Zoom link or our YouTube channel. You can find it, and that form there is to sign up if you want to recite the Great Compassion Mantra uh, to join in. Okay, and the next event we have a call with Reverend Hung Shur with Service Space um, called the Alchemy of Bowing. An awakened call is a weekly call that Service Space does with various uh, maybe say esteemed. Uh, speakers. And so this week, they'll be inviting Reverend Hung Shur to talk about bowing. And I believe uh, Nipun will be doing the interviewing. So it should be a, a meaning, very interesting and meaningful interview. Mm -hmm. um, Jing Wei and myself are definitely going to join. Here in Australia, it's Thursday morning at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. They do record it. So if you can't make it at that time, you can watch it afterwards. Uh, but I think they also have Q&A, so you could join in and maybe ask a question too. But you have to sign up if you want to join, and you will re receive an email with the Zoom link. Yeah. You just have to put your email address. It's very fast. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So... And Rohan will be talking about bowing. So that's a very important practice for our monastery. Uh, next, we have the Noble Friendship Pod. This is also part of service space. Um, uh, but Nipun, maybe a couple of months ago, was talking with Jing Weisher and myself that after the Boundless Hearts Pod we were doing, we really need to do one on Noble Friendship. So, um, so this is it. Uh, that's for two are, weeks. Are not familiar, you're not familiar with the word pod, think group. Think group, yeah. Think online retreat, a group of people doing an online retreat together, and it's a. Uh, you know what, what is unique about this particular retreat is kind of uh, kept the two mode is offline and online as well. So mm -hmm. every day, and any participants who join receive a different kind of tasks. This is like a little bit like a game. Yeah, you have a task for your head. You're reading kind of inspiring articles, videos, and so forth is the uh, hand part, so it's kind of uh, practice, but how we can integrate some materials into our daily lives. And the heart, what is the reflection, what we share in the group. And people have an opportunity to read also others' reflections, make a comments. It's very interactive, very dynamic and transformative process. So this is, will be for 14 days. Yeah, 14 days. And maybe if you want just the spirit of the sense of noble friendship, it's how do we relate to one another with these four hearts of kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity um, that we're, we're, you could say, not getting, kind of becoming codependent, but actually our relationships become liberating. Their li relations are not entangling, but actually liberating. So this is, this is a noble friendship pod. And we started with befriending ourselves. Yeah. Like how to be a friend to ourselves first and move to relationships and so forth. Okay, and then the next one, next event we have is Three Steps, One Bow for India. Um, clearly, there's been 
a lot of suffering in India. And we're just looking at the news and they're just, the stories are heartbreaking. And it's sort of, as Ramangshir mentioned, I think in the lectures about it also spreading to other countries. And so we've expanded it to include other countries. Um, but then of course, people also know Taiwan is going through difficulty. So, um, so however big our heart wants to be um, for India, for the neighboring countries, for the whole world, um, bowing is one way we can you say there's a connection between our purification of our hearts and the purification of the world and the well-being of the world and so this is our way of, of doing that kind of practice mm-hmm. yeah so if you can join in it's friday 7 to 8 a.m and then the rest is our regular activities so um please tune in if you're interested and one thing changed uh, yesterday uh, professor marty verhoeven had the last class in this semester and he will continue lecturing of Avatamsaka Sutra, I think it will begin around September, yeah, probably beginning September. of September. And also I think on Wednesdays, I'm not sure about Steven Tainer. He's probably yeah. also have a break. Yeah, right? I know he's already on a break now. Yeah. I already know he's on a break. So yeah, but um, otherwise we have our daily recitation practices as Rung Shura shows you now. So you can join us for four or five hours a day, probably. <laughs> and also, it's good to remember that Ravang Shur is lecturing every Friday, also at yes. twelve thirty in California. And on right now is the Universal Door Chapter. Yeah, um, Pumen Pin from Lotus Sutra. You can find an information about it. You can sign up on we'll the front re- page. Yeah, we we'll receive a uh, link. Okay, is that it? That's it. That's it. That's a lot. All right. Thank you for that. So please do uh, take part in those. They, that's probably the silver lining in the pandemic lockdowns was um, discovering virtual participation in Dharma events. Many people would have said, you know, gee, I would sure like to join you all, but I'm, I'm in Malaysia, I'm in Taiwan, or I'm in uh, you know, Calgary and I can't get to where you are. Well. Here's the link, you know, here's the password. See you online. That's one of the real benefits. Alrighty. Um, the way that Buddhism is uh, not an ideology, it's a methodology. I want to invite everybody to, to share the next activity, which is dedicating merit, transferring merit. This is uh, an activity, right? It is uh, interactive you can do it. And in fact, we hope you will. Make a wish, say, join you together in this online community to look into the ninth stage of the Flower Garland Sutra, brought me a certain amount of peace of mind or happiness or clarity. And I would like to share that with other living beings to give Dharma, they say, right? to practice the giving of Dharma, sharing it with a, with a thought. Um, the power of prayer, yes, it is the power of prayer. If you un- interpret it that way, that's the way it works. It is um, intercessory prayer if you're raised in a Catholic context, right? We give away the goodness, make a wish, send it out. And we do it with a melody. We do it with the power of medicine Buddha, Aisajaraj Guru, Tathagata, right? His, his power and his mantra. Here's a Dharani, right? The power, the power of Medicine Buddha's mantra um, is what carries these wishes for goodness uh, wider and further, right to the heart of living beings, All right? So that's the theory, and it stays a theory unless you make it a practice. So let's do that. Let's turn theory to practice. Let's put it into practice. Here we go. Make your wish.
Guanyin Bodhisattva on my desktop. We can bow three times to Guanyin and then three times to Master Ma. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. I'm, I, 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 I don't read your fingers. Eight zero. Eight zero. Eighty. My goodness. Wow. Eighty five. Holy mackerel. How many on YouTube? I wonder. We should have asked before the transfer. Uh, 130. Lovely. All right. And you add the Vietnamese room and we have a worldwide Dharma community. Be well. See you all next week. Aum Mi Tho